Greetings to you, Bill. Greetings to everybody uh, uh, listening, following this uh, discussion today. Uh, Bill, I was asked by the colleagues from DOE to have a tour de horizon uh, with you about the energy and climate uh, issues. I would like to start with a, 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 the concept and a, a typical, uh, uh, I mean, in my view, one of the most important concepts of the fight against climate change, which is innovation. Why do I want to start with innovation? Because you are one of the leading voices when it comes to innovation, the clean energy technologies. And second, the colleagues uh, who are organizing this meeting, the ARPA-E, they are uh, supporting a lot of uh, important uh, innovation uh, technologies in terms of the government uh, support. Now, uh, let me start with the, this question. But what kind of role you think governments should have in order to foster innovation in terms of clean energy technologies at home and also uh, uh, globally? Well, there's no doubt uh, government plays a key role, uh, both in terms of funding, uh, basic R&D, uh, funding challenges uh, to achieve certain technical goals, which is RPE, where RPE has come in and uh, done such a fantastic job, uh, you know, having great people backing some of these early stage companies. Uh, it's been fantastic to see. The government also, though, has to uh, fund projects to get uh, technologies up to scale and create a demand for green products, even when they sell at a higher price, the so-called green premium uh, that I highlight is a key metric of the progress we're making, you know, how can we get started on green steel or green cement unless we have some resources, uh, including from government, that help create demand there so we can start scaling these things up and get on that learning curve. You know, innovation rarely comes in the form that immediately it eliminates the green premium. It's a series of innovations uh, and you have learning by doing which has been so successful with solar and land-based wind and lithium-ion batteries uh, that as the scale went up, uh, in some cases, we were even surprised by those incredible cost reductions. So we need to you know, look at all the different sectors and activate innovation uh, in those sectors, uh, including the hard ones. You know, I've been accused of overly valuing innovation and I'm, you know, I'm probably guilty of that. Uh, but if the rich countries, if all they do for the world is fund at high cost uh, reduction of emissions, then we won't solve the climate problem. The rich countries actually owe it to the world to take their innovation power, which is you know, a very high percentage of the world's innovation power, and lower these green premiums so that we can say to middle-income countries, like, for example, India, yes, you should use green products uh, because look, we brought that extra cost, that green premium down so dramatically that between your domestic resources and some overseas resources, you can completely switch over across all areas of emission. Uh, uh, fully agree with you, uh, Bill. Uh, I don't know if you saw last week, we wrote a report, we published a report, Net Zero 2050, and in this report, one of our findings, in my view, is critical, namely, of all the emission reductions the world needs to do between now and 2050, about half of them needs to come from technologies which are under development now. They are not, uh, they are not mature technologies. And with the, with the renewables, efficiency, electric cars, we can do a lot of work, but uh, there's a lot of uh, to be done with the technologies under development, as you, ju as you just said. Yeah, I thought that report was very important because, you know, the IEA uh, does such a good job of, you know, tracking what's really going on with energy usage and then projecting out that unless something dramatic happens, both on policy and innovation, uh, the amount of energy we'll be getting from hydrocarbons, even out in 2030, 2040, 2050, will still be very large. And so to have your group come out and say, well, to achieve these goals, uh, you know, here's milestones and here's 
new product areas like green steel or green cement exactly. that we don't have any reasonable approach uh, for those today. The, the cost premium, say, for cement uh, is about double if you just uh, try and, and solve that in a, in a brute force way. And so, you know, I, I hope people really look at those milestones. You know, you had 2035 uh, rich countries having uh, green electricity generation. And yet, do we really have a concrete plan? 15 years, you know, when you're talking about building transmission and the scale of capital to be put in and really understanding the reliability, exactly. even in the face of tough weather events like, you know, typhoons in uh, Tokyo or cold uh, weather fronts in the Midwest of the US, you know, we should li literally, and my Breakthrough Energy Science Group is working on this, we should have models that we can look and do what if, okay, what is that grid look like in Japan or in North America? So, you know, that report uh, is really bridging now the aspirations and the practical uh, considerations. Uh, so I hope, I hope uh, that gets a lot of visibility. Uh, it gets a lot of visibility. We are very happy with that, but also we are uh, happy build uh, you just summarize it perfectly. The aspirations of the governments, we try to translate it in the concrete actions. We have more than 400 milestones, uh, uh, what needs to happen and when it has to happen. So uh, these two issues. And one of the topics uh, we cover in our report is the, in my view, a critical technology, which is carbon capture and storage. So uh, as you know, uh, I am sure, uh, uh, well, it is not a technology without any controversy uh, around the world, but when we look at the numbers uh, at the IEA, uh, which is our main job, when you look at the infrastructure, especially lock-in infrastructure, uh, the iron, steel, cement, and the others, it's a must, we like it or not. I would very much like to hear your views about the carbon capture and storage, that family. Yeah, so it's there will be some emissions in 2050, you know, we're not going to get rid of cows emitting methane uh, in poor countries, including Africa. Uh, you know, some of the poor countries will still have, uh, you know, gasoline transportation and even some coal plants. And so if you want to get to net zero, uh, then you'll have to have something that's pulling CO2 out of the air. Uh, you know, I've been the biggest funder of various carbon capture companies, both directly and through Breakthrough Energy Ventures. And, you know, today, if you go out like I have to offset my emissions, uh, there's offerings at like $600 a ton. Now, there are projects at much larger scale uh, that look like they have a good chance of getting that down to $100 a ton. Ideally, we'd like to get well below that because you know, even if you have to do 10% of today's emissions at $100 a ton, you know, that's, uh, you know, 500 billion a year, uh, which is a lot, you know, double the total foreign aid uh, at its peak. Uh, so very, very substantial. So it direct air capture has to play a role, including figuring out the long-term safe storage. And we have to get the cost of that down uh, very substantially. You know, if you could get below $50, which I don't know that you can, uh, then it could play a stronger role. And there are, you know, five or six companies out there uh, doing different approaches. And, um, you know, so that there's no way to get to zero without that direct air capture piece. Fully agreed. Uh, fully agreed. And the, the, the problem is, uh, I mean, the uh, as we all know, the biggest increase in the emissions will come from Asia. I mean, China, India, Indonesia. How to make carbon capture and storage, this technology, a part of the energy, tech, uh, energy sector is a, a critical issue. In US, uh, you mentioned your efforts, the government's 45Q, UK is working on that, Norway, a, a country which pushes the button uh, strongly. But when it comes to developing countries, the Asia, for example, Iron steel, uh, the uh, power sector, cement, 
Uh, what are the ways and mechanisms one could think to foster the carbon capture and storage in those countries? Well, the the first step is to drive this innovation to try and improve that dollar per ton cost, both of point capture and uh, direct air capture. Uh, you know, to me, when we think of countries, uh, it's very important that we we cannot give a pass to the middle income countries. Countries at India's level of wealth and above really need to participate very directly in getting rid of emissions. There are countries, the the low income countries, <clears throat> which is a, a few countries plus a number in Africa, they're the ones that get the pass. But getting the cost down so that all the middle income countries, and that's you know Mexico, Brazil, Indonesia, Vietnam, uh, you know China at the high end of of middle income and, and super, super important in India, uh, you know, further down in the GDP per person, they, you know, they need to participate. And whether we can get them there by 2050 or not is a mix of uh, politics, innovation, uh, and somewhat tariff policies that at least you won't have imported products uh, that have high emissions coming in. We don't need to do that right away, but there'll come a point where a regime that doesn't let uh, people uh, compete by being uh, dirty, in a sense, uh, that will become necessary. And so it's great that you know countries get together. Uh, it's good they have short-term goals, but we now really need that those meetings to talk about the long-term goals as well, not just the 2030, 2040, but hey, what are you going to do in the hard sectors? Uh, you know, most of the cement in the world uh, comes out of middle income countries, of course, because they're in a very physical infrastructure phase of their economic development. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, for us, this is a critical issue as well, because when you look at the Asia, the average age of the, the iron steel, about 11 years old, very, very young. I mean, you cannot, ask them to retire tomorrow uh, because the, the investment uh, went uh, in and therefore uh, such technologies will be very important. Bill, let me move back to the existing options to address the uh, uh, climate change reduced emissions, which is uh, which we call the first fuel, energy efficiency. So uh, uh, in our uh, report, uh, we think that to reach the 2050 net zero, in addition to all these technologies, renewables, and so on, we have to improve the energy efficiency about for global energy efficiency, 4% uh, per year, which is about two and a half times faster than what we are having today. So what do you think? Do you think energy efficiency can play a critical role to reduce the emissions? Yes, we put together our venture group, which is under the Breakthrough Energy uh, umbrella, we said that we're only gonna invest in things that can have a dramatic effect uh, on climate change. And we said energy efficiency is definitely one of those areas. Uh, you know, so things like, uh, you know, heat pumps uh, are more efficient and a lot of innovation in, in that space. You know, some areas of industrial processes like making fertilizer from methane, there isn't, you know, they've really optimized that process. Whereas in other areas, particularly like building design, where you have uh, your sort of over air conditioning in the summer and you're overheating in the, uh, the winter, their efficiency gains uh, going after particularly new build can be uh, very dramatic. So it varies a lot uh, by, by sector. In some ways, it's the easiest because usually uh, you also see some uh, economic benefit by not having to put as much uh, energy cost in there and helping markets to work effectively so those upfront investments are made. Uh, there's a lot of really important government policy uh, involved in that. You know, For my personal offsets, one of the things I did was go to low-income housing developments and fund the capital for electric heat pumps uh, rather than natural gas heating. And then they would get 
uh, lower monthly bills uh, for that, and I would take the uh, the credit for the uh, emissions Excellent. avoided there. Excellent. The I, you mentioned India a few a few minutes ago. Let me give you one, uh, uh, in my view, very striking uh, uh, number. In South Asia, the biggest driver of electricity consumption is uh, air conditions, by far, air conditions. And in South uh, Asia, in order to provide the same comfort, like in the US and Japan, air conditions consume three times more electricity because they are inefficient. Just the same comfort, like in Japan or US, to provide it, three times more elect electricity, and therefore you build a lot of power plants, emissions, money goes there. So uh, one of the things what we are doing, for example, with those governments, to set standards for the air conditions so that uh, they are uh, uh, their uh, efficiency levels are at international level, so that they use less electricity, have the same comfort, and build less uh, power plants. So they keep the money in the pocket and no emissions. Uh, so this is, a, I think, a critical issue, energy efficiency, as you rightly mentioned, both the household products, but also uh, retrofitting uh, at home. Let me move to another subject, another sector, which is uh, critical, which is transportation. It is about 25% of global emissions uh, in some countries more, some countries less. Do you think the electrification of the transportation sector cure, uh, can cure all of our problems or we have to think beyond uh, electrification? Well, it is a miracle that it looks like passenger cars over the next 10 to 15 years will get to what I call a green premium of zero. That is the upfront cost, the savings on maintenance, uh, the range, particularly as you get charge infrastructure and fast charging. But that's only a piece of transportation. Uh, when you look at heavy transportation, like long distance trucking or airplanes or even container ships, the energy density of batteries being 35 times less than liquid uh, fuels means that most of those applications without uh, an unexpected you know, wild improvement uh, in that battery energy density per kilogram, uh, you're going to have to use a different approach. And uh, fuels that are made biologically or electrically or a switch to hydrogen or in some cases ammonia, you know, are being explored. We need low carbon liquid fuels uh, and we should be investing heavily in both the electrofuels approach, the hydrogen approach, and the biofuels approach. Uh, you know, for sustainable aviation fuel, uh, it's a, a big challenge. But for those long distance flights, we're not going to be able to stick batteries into those airplanes. It, yeah. It's just not going to happen. So this is uh, one of the areas, I think, a bit uh, uh, a bit blind spot of the transportation discussion, you mentioned aviation. I mean, today it is about close to uh, 10%, but uh, when you look at the last few years, Asia just started to fly. The activity, Asian activity is one to seven to uh, United States uh, or uh, others. And uh, in our uh, uh, report, uh, one of the milestones we want to see around 2040 at least 50% of the aviation fuels uh, comes from biofuels and uh, other uh, 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 options. But do you see it is realistic to get 50%? I mean, the aviation fuels because it is a really a tough call. Uh, what would you say? Yeah. So I went out, you know, to get rid of my footprint, and I bought uh, biofuels, and so I'm paying twice as much for the aviation fuel, uh, and. Now we have to scale up, uh, you know, in my case, it's a biofuel uh, that's that's being used there. It The premium cost is, is a huge challenge because uh, fuel cost really is a meaningful part of the cost of aviation. And uh, we need a lot of pilot projects. The If you can get really cheap green hydrogen, 
then of course you can use that as an input for many things, steel, fertilizer, even uh, as a way of making liquid fuels. Uh, you know, people are dreaming that we're gonna bring that cost down, you know, like a factor of four, and then it does start to pencil out. That's only one path. There are many paths uh, that could work there. And so another area that not only do we need to fund startup companies, we also need to fund projects, you know, and get that scale up by like 20 times over the next five years uh, to see which approach can become economic. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a perfect example of where we've been working on the easier stuff with lower green premiums and not enough on the hard stuff that have very, very high green premiums. Uh, hydrogen, uh, a technology uh, which is loved by everybody. Everybody loves hydrogen. So it is very rare in the energy <laughs> world uh, that everybody loves one technology. Go to s another technology which not everybody loves, but still a very critical one, which is nuclear power. I live in France and we get a lot of electricity from uh, nuclear power. And nuclear power today uh, is the second largest uh, uh, carbon-free electricity uh, uh, generation source in the world after hydropower. But in the, in the United States or in Europe, number one, uh, the source of uh, uh, carbon-free electricity. Now, as uh, we all know, there is a lot of debate about nuclear power, but the dropping the nuclear from the uh, options we have would make in my view, reaching our climate targets much more expensive, if, if at all possible, with the current technologies and maybe the technologies uh, to come. What are your views, uh, Bill, about uh, nuclear today and tomorrow? Well, I'm probably the most biased person there is because looking at the lack of from scratch designs in the nuclear fission er area and seeing that the existing players, uh, sadly, because of economic challenges they faced as they had reactor cost overruns. Uh, you know, I funded uh, over a decade ago, a company called TerraPower, uh, which now has uh, a 50-50 uh, demonstration project with the US government uh, that over the next five years will, you know, show what we can do having started from scratch and doing a, a digital design. The nuclear industry is failing because of cost. Yes, there's problems with safety and waste uh, and proliferation, but uh, the even LNG, which is of course way more expensive than natural gas coming through a pipe in the US, it's just made it, you know, it fortunately it's outcompeted coal, but it means that these nuclear plants are like four times more expensive then can be affordable. And so we need to simplify those designs in the name of economics and safety. The fact that it's a weather dependent source, uh, independent source makes a huge difference. And also that you can store up that heat and only generate the electricity when the sun's not shining or the wind's not blowing uh, uh, as we're doing in the, the this demo plant, Natrium. Uh, you know, I do think it has a critical role to play. And after all, we need to invest on many innovation paths, even fusion, although that one, uh, there's a lot of scientific work there that means we can't count on it. But having non-weather dependent significant sources will allow those grids to work. Like during that typhoon period in Japan, you know, how are you keeping people warm? Uh, the, the storage uh, possibilities can't get you uh, to that level. In fact, you know, right now, <coughs> um, natural gas with, with uh, carbon capture would still probably be your best way, but that comes at a, a huge premium. If I can, one uh, further question on nuclear, a specific one, if you can elaborate a bit. SMRs, uh, uh, what do you think can SMRs be a part of the, at least uh, in some countries, part of the solution? Well, I'm not, the TerraPower reactor is most economic as a large reactor, as a gigawatt reactor, yeah. even somewhat bigger than our demo plant. 
Uh, you know, we looked at SMR and just couldn't get the economics to work. And after all, siting is a problem. And so our view is we're just largely going to put nuclear plants where there already have been nuclear plants and then rely on really good transmission to get there. So, you know, I love anyone uh, who feels they can contribute, but we couldn't get the SMR economics to work. In some cases, they were as bad as today's reactors. Uh, but you know, let's see what they can do. Um, you know, it, 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 I hope it can work, uh, but we got the cost down by a factor of four by reducing the nuclear island, but staying at a uh, very large size. Uh, I hope the, uh, the current U.S. administration, I know that they have a very comprehensive uh, energy program led by the Department of Energy, looks at all these options, including the SMRs. Now, uh, 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 Bill, we are coming end of our uh, time, at, in my view, moving from the technology to uh, another part of the uh, climate uh, debate, namely the issue of developed countries and developing countries. So again, uh, we believe, and it is reflected in our uh, net zero report came out uh, last week, perhaps uh, the developing countries need to get some support from developed countries and the so-called advanced economies, I should say, maybe it is a better expression, should finish the race to zero before the others, before the developing countries. How do you see this uh, dilemma? Because I expect in the towards the COP26 meeting, this will be one of the key topics that the world leaders uh, will discuss. With your helicopter view, you look at these issues. Uh, what is your take on that? Yes, I think the rich countries uh, owe to all the countries to innovate and to innovate at full speed, whether it's dramatically increasing R&D budgets like Mission Innovation uh, was announced at the Paris talks, you know, doing more things like RPE. You know, I wish RPE was even bigger and that other countries were learning uh, from that as a great example of, of advancing these technologies. And then we need to be smart about the projects uh, that we build, and a lot of those will be built in the rich countries. I don't think it serves us well to think of countries in two tiers, developed and developing. That, you know, is such a, a antiquated thing because, you know, the range, there's a, like a factor of 50 range in there. I, you know, nobody, the rich world is not going to subsidize China to reduce its carbon emissions. We can do cooperative R&D, we can make it easier for them with those advances. Uh, it just that the numbers are too large uh, to do that. Even all the way down to India, you're not going to have gigantic uh, subsidies there. And, and so the innovation pathway is important. Once you get below that, okay, that's a different thing. So the tiering is very important. We need to get rid of that sort of uh, two uh, categories and at least think about the the three categories. Now, some of the middle income countries won't probably won't hit 2050, which you know means that our degree warming is likely to exceed our goals. Uh, but at least by 2060, uh, and ideally well before that, we want even those middle income countries to achieve zero. I think the uh, what I uh, want to say is that I believe there are different responsibilities of different countries uh, here. We can, I think, we have to uh, recognize this. And what I want to underline here is the uh, the very we need very badly international collaboration here. We talk about race to zero. Unless everybody finishes the race, nobody wins the race. So therefore, we need everybody to be uh, on board. And here. Of course, technology, innovation, uh, as you rightly mentioned, and international collaboration are key uh, words. Bill, uh, very many thanks uh, for your uh, uh, time and your uh, wise uh, thoughts. Looking forward to host you in Paris in, in person, hopefully sometime uh, soon. And uh, all the best uh, to you for all your undertakings. Very many thanks. Bye bye. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.